I need a little bit of light. <laughs> Is there, yeah. Right there? Okay, well, that'll be fine then, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, this is great, like that. Okay. Yeah, you know, I got this one now, so I think I'm okay. Oh, oh well, let's see. Yeah, all right. Okay, I'm just going to start. My name is Jackie Corey, and I'm honored to be the new education chair of the Urantia Book Fellowship. And I well, thank you. <laughs> um, welcome to the first ever Macavente Melchizedek celebration on Urantia. How wonderful you're able to attend and actually made it to your seat. There's a reason we haven't met for several years, and this year has been a challenge too. So thank you for making the effort, and I think you'll be pleased with the conference. Glasses, please. Okay. Um, the passing of David Kulicki so suddenly last October was a very significant loss for me personally, as it was to countless people, many students living in China, and his entire education team. As God would have it, David's passing ignited our commu committee, and we stepped up ready to explore a new potential within each of us. We worked together to help realize David's long planned venture to honor Macaventa on his 4,000th or now 4,000th and one anniversary. Oh, am I, do I need to be here, Ken? Better? Okay, that sounds better to me too. There's so much I could say about David's passing, how it has changed me personally, and tell you more about his team and the volunteers that joined together in loving teamwork to present you with this year's summer study session. But instead, it's my honor to introduce you to the chair of SSS 22 and tell you a little bit about her, and that is Dr. Matab Tarani. Matab and I have enjoyed getting to know each other working on this conference. For many years, we didn't know each other very well, even though we were both on David Kulicki's education committee for many years. Uh, we were aware that he was continually encouraging both of us for higher service, um, and, and David believed in our potential to be in leadership roles in the fellowship, and after a decade or more of encouragement, here we are. So, Matab was born and raised in Iran. Uh, where Shiite Islam is the where Shiite Islam is the dominant religion, and although her family was not particularly religious, she was conscious of God from a young age. And by young adulthood, she described that she had developed a robust sense of devotion to and reverence for God, but her faith felt passive and stagnant. Shortly after Matab started college in the USA while taking comparative religions, comparative religions course at Kent State University, looking for answers to big questions, she was gifted with a Urantia book. Fortunately, her professor was a man named Jeff Waddles. I admire Matab for recognizing what gift Jeff had given her. Matab and Jeff have, have had many discussions and remain close friends. She considers their relationship a huge honor and blessing because Jeff is, in her opinion, one of the most gifted scholars of the Urantia book. And I love how Matab described her experience upon finding the Urantia book. Uh, the way she said it was, as in the case for many Urantia book readers, the revelation is so far beyond what I could ever imagine I could receive, but one that comes with great responsibility. Yes, I agree. It was so far beyond what we thought we could receive. Transcends what each of us thought we'd find in our search, I'm sure. And Matab earned her PhD in Amer here in America, which is impressive in its of itself, but English being her second language, it's quite respectful. Matab currently works as an auditory neuroscientist in training. I love and respect Matab for her accomplishments and especially for her lack of affectation and for her beautiful sincerity. And she is. Maybe that thing's making me hot. So unfortunately, Matab's throat is um, 
kind of inflamed and bothering her and she was going to do the welcome for you but i'm going to read it for her so this vision that i'm matab because this is her words okay <clears throat> all right brothers and sisters friends of the fifth epical revelation Welcome to the summer study session 2022, organized by the Education Committee of the Urantia Book Fellowship. It is such a blessing to once again be together in person to see longtime friends and honor the memory of those who have moved on and meet new ones. This weekend, we will take a deep dive into the life and teachings of a being who has been and continues to be intimately connected with our planet and our destiny, Makaventa Melchizedek currently serving as Michael's personal ambassador on Jerusalem, has worn many hats on Urantia. Among a team of 12 Melchizedek planetary receivers, Bekaventa was the one who bravely volunteered to materialize on earth and reveal God to man when the light of truth was in danger of extinction. He has devoted himself to us and we want to dedicate this summer study session to him. Our beloved friend and late chair, David Kulicki, had many brilliant ideas, and celebrating Makaventa's 4,000th birthday was one of them. Though he is not with us in person now to witness his idea come to fruition, he surely is with us here in spirit. We also dedicate this conference to David, who we love and miss dearly. Before... Um, this is what Mata would have said. Before I turn this over to our next speaker, she, I'd like, she wanted to acknowledge her team, planning team, as she said, David surely would have. And so first and foremost, the amazing trio of individuals who have been the engine of the team. And that's Jackie Corey for her wise leadership and planning our social events and for always being a few steps ahead in nearly every aspect of the process. Thank you. Ken Kaiser. <laughs> Ken Kaiser for the extraordinary attention to detail. At his second Myler service, coordinating all things on site and preparing the program booklet. <laughs> and Tim Duffy, who um, I will now introduce to you in a bit more detail shortly for single-handedly crafting the educational program of SSS and coordinating the presentation. So Jackie, Kim and Ken. Okay. okay. Thank you, Martha. Um, she also wants to acknowledge and thank Jeff Thies, Fellowship's Executive Director and Sue Sacomb, Fellowship's President for all their tireless work Home, excuse me, Sue. Um, fellowship present for all their tireless work and support with the many aspects of planning. So Jeff and Sue, do you mind? Where are you here? I'm too busy. Jeff here? There you are. Second. Second. Okay. Okay. Are you hearing me okay? Are they am I okay? Loud enough. Um, last but not least is our extended planning team who selflessly contributed much of their time and energy and wisdom to the event to whom we are so grateful. That's Susie Rollins, who isn't here. She was our secretary, Barbara Newsom, Cecilia Lampley, Trudy Cooper, Marilyn Kulicki, Christina Seaborn, Katie Roach, Derek Samaras, uh, Larry Bowman, and Tony Daniels, who's not here either. If you just heard your name and are able, please stand and be recognized. And we just want to acknowledge anyone else. Thank you for graciously volunteering. It takes a, it does take a team and it takes a lot of people to help us. So now I'm going to introduce Tim. And Tim is our master of ceremonies. He's the MC for the weekend. And the amazing job he's done on the program. We're going to learn so much this weekend. Um, the Urantia book found Tim in 1986. For several years, he read and studied the book with only one other close friend. After moving to Chicago, he has been actively involved in the Urantia community. In addition to being an active member of the Fellowship Education Committee, he is the academic director of UBIS, the Urantia Book Internet School, and assistant secretary for the first Urantia Society here in, Ura in Chicago, <laughs> Urantia. 
Many of you, that's what I was going to say on your radio. Okay, Chicago. It is your radio. Many of you who may recognize him from, many, many of you may recognize him from last year's virtual SSS as he was the keynote speaker and the Zoom host for that event. This year, he has been the person on our planning team primarily responsible for the program and have put and has put together, we've put together for this conference. Tim graduated from high school from the um, Interlochen is that right? Arts Academy in Michigan, spent a year at Oberlin Conservatory of Music as a music composition major, and finished his undergraduate degree in philosophy at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. He graduated from the University of Chicago Law School in 1994, where he served as editor-in-chief of Law Review. He clerked for, the judge, uh, for Judge Douglas Ginsburg in Washington, D.C., I knew that, and spent 25 years working as a lawyer at a large law firm in Chicago. Tim still keeps pretty busy. He practices law on his own, helps his wife with her businesses, and has worked a series of startup companies. And is, like many of us, trying to reduce the amount of time he spends doing all these things so he can enjoy working in and for the Urantia Book community. Tim lives with his wife of 25 years, Bet Ann, in Lake Forest, Illinois. Their son, Kevin, is a junior at Utah State University and an aspiring, aspiring airline pilot. So please welcome Tim Duffy. Thank you, Jackie, and Matab through Jackie and, and Jackie. It's been not only a great pleasure for me to work with Matab and Jackie and all the team and, and of so many people, it's also an extra special treat for me because this is the first time I'm meeting them in person, uh, as is true with so many of you. And it's, it's really a great joy. And I'm sure I'll talk about that all weekend. So you'll hear more of it. Um, I'm going to introduce Stuart Kerr. I promise we'll get to the program at some point. Uh, but uh, I just want to say a few words uh, about what we're about to undertake over the next two and a half days. Perhaps the most wonderful thing I think about the Urantia book is what it does to broaden our perspective in so many ways. It gives us new and much larger frames of reference within which to think about ourselves, our destiny, and our universe. My favorite book besides the Urantia book is Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. And as I'm sure many of you know, it starts it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, and we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. Sounds like today, right? Uh, and the thing that we treasure today, as <laughs> Dickens treasured a while ago, is living in a world and dealing with a world where all those things can be true, where it can be the best of times and the worst of times. And the Urantia book, I think, gives us a frame to live in a world where both those things can be true and grow and progress that world. For example, we're told and we know God is a personal loving father with whom we have the most intimate relationship possible. There are adjusters. But we're also told and we know he is utterly beyond our comprehension and almost impossibly far removed from us. 
we're told that there are fundamental divine truths that rule the universe. Yet we know from everything we see, there's much disorder and much chaos. We're told nothing of value is ever lost, but we experience loss ourselves constantly. We're told even the whole physical universe is only a one plane of reality and that we will eventually transcend it. Yet sometimes we can't get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> we're told we are to become something perfect yet we order we need to be imperfect in order to do so we're told that there is universal unity that we often get lost in our differences the urantia book lets us hold all of these truths it gives us a container big enough and grand enough in which to hold th these truths. It gives us the ability to be unified and to have unity without necessarily having or needing uniformity. It is statistically very likely that in this room, we hold a variety of different views that in other contexts would cause divisions and arguments and maybe even prevent people from meeting with each other, certainly from talking intelligently to each other on the news. But we all came here for a different reason and on a different premise. We all came here with the premise that we're the same, that we're unified. Uh, I'm sorry, that, 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 yeah, that we're unified, even if we're not uniform. And the Urantia book is what gave us that ability. And from that, good things will happen, hopefully, this weekend. Um, I just want to do, read a couple passages that, uh, in my view, should open every study session. Uh, this is from paper 103, section one, paragraph one. The unity of religious experience among a social or racial group derives from the identical nature of the God fragment indwelling the individual. It is this divine in man that gives origin to his unselfish interest in the welfare of other men. But since personality is unique, no two mortals are alike. It inevitably follows that no two human beings can similarly interpret the leadings and urgings of the spirit of divinity, when, which lives within their minds. A group of mortals can experience spiritual unity but they can never attain philosophic uniformity. And this diversity of interpretation of religious thought and experience is shown by the fact that 20th century theologians and philosophers have formulated upwards of 500 different definitions of religion. In reality, every human being defines religion in terms of his own experiential interpretation of the divine impulses emanating from the God spirit that indwells him. And therefore must such an interpretation be unique and wholly different from the religious philosophy of all other human beings. But while your religion is a matter of personal experience, it is most important that you should be exposed to the knowledge of a vast number of other religious experiences the diverse interpretations of other and diverse mortals to the end that you may prevent your religious life from becoming egocentric, circumscribed, selfish, and unsocial. So that's our goal this weekend, to be not egocentric, circumscribed, selfish, or unsocial. We have the perfect remedy for that, for isolation, coming together, sharing our own personal religions in a with a unified purpose, with a unified love for each other, recognizing what we all share and celebrating how we all differ. So I urge everyone to, as I'm sure is already the case, approach the coming talks and workshops with that in mind. And um, we'll see what happens. Now it embarrassingly occurs to me but I forgot to ask Stuart for his bio so I could introduce him. 
Um, but that's okay because I know Stuart, even though like Jackie Matop, I met him for the first time in the physical form a couple of hours ago. But I've uh, heard him speak on the internet, <laughs> on Zoom, and he's heard me, and he's been in uh, talks and sessions I've hosted and vice versa. And he spoke, uh, I was the first speaker at last year's session, and he was the last. And I can tell you he has a keen mind and a, um, a beautiful sense of the scope and beauty of the book and a command of its details. I'm sure you all saw the uh, the, 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 in, in your folders when you checked in, uh, the uh, booklet that has the beautiful picture on the front. And th that is Stuart's booklet. Uh, and, and, and he made the content and he graciously had them published and, and printed uh, and, and, dist and distributed here for us as a uh, helpful uh, reference, you know, for all the, the study we're going to be undertaking and, and really just a beautiful presentation that he put together and it's, it's for sale on Amazon in case you want more. Uh, but he bought 150 of them from himself. I'm sure giving a lot of the money to Amazon and uh, then uh, sent them to my house and we put them in these folders and we're very grateful. So that's what you need to know about Stuart. <laughs> and, and you can catch up on his family and all that stuff, you know, at, at your leisure. The other thing I will tell you about Stuart is that uh, uh, he, he had a, um, uh, a bit of an accident a couple months ago and was uh, in the hospital and, and injured. And we were very fearful that you'd have to listen to me for another 45 minutes instead of him. But uh, uh, I, I said, the first I heard, I said, we can't ask Stuart if he's coming because he's going to say yes, whether it's true or not. Uh, and, and, and I knew, and, and given time, it just happened. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be there. Here's the books and let's go. And, and again, that's a little bit of all you need to know about Stuart. So uh, let me make sure we can get his, pre his beautiful presentation on the screen and we will get started finally. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> yeah, you're right, we'll never get to. I'll call April Helen back because they're on YouTube. <laughs> Come on, Take just a minute to get the uh, juices of the computer flowing. Is there a... Um, what I find here is what I do at Alt, uh, Control, Alt, and... Oh, and there were... Delete. Something. It always opens up. Oh, okay. I don't know why it does that. Let me get sure. my password in there. No one close your eyes. Huh? No, they, they, they don't. And get this. There it is. You stand more behind yeah. it. Yeah. I Oops. Uh -oh. uh, let me try to get. Sure. All right. There we go. It'll, it'll, it'll go in a minute. It'll kick in, yeah. I like that background. So. All right. There we go. Great. Now we're good. I think we're all set. Okay. Hello, everybody. I want to say that my greatest pleasure is all of my life since the mid 1980s, I've gone to every Urantia conference that I could get to. And every time I came, I always made sure to try to give a workshop. And I've given many, do a dozen plus workshops over the years. Uh, now, I just turned 69 years old. And I the book I got at on my 21st birthday. And this was after 20 years of battling the Father in heaven, because I did not like the fact that this is not the best of all worlds, that the innocent often suffer. 
and I could not handle it, and I could never figure it into my being, and I put the buck on his desk and said, I'm taking you to cosmic court, and I'm going to decide whether or not this is a good creation, and you made it the best you could. Now, obviously, the tough one was there. The reason why I could never properly put him and prosecute him in cosmic court was because of the reality of love. And I knew love was real. And if everything else came from him and love came from him, I was never able to finalize my prosecution against the Heavenly Father. And at the age of 20, my mother, the family, my family broke up. I had no family. I was on Georgia Tech on Thanksgiving weekend because I had no home to go to. And I had no more money in which to pay for another semester of going to Georgia Tech. I had reached rock bottom at the age of 20 on Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, what I did for the first time was something my mother taught me to do at the age of four to get down by the bed on my knees and pray to the Father. And I was in desperation. I had reached the very bottom that you could reach. And I said, Father, I can't fight you anymore. I don't have the energy and I can't finish off this energy here. And this is when I believe my thought adjuster opened the floodgates. There was no time element in it. It was an instantaneous transcendent event of being filled with the light and the love of God. It was like Paul on his way to Damascus getting knocked off his camel. It was an experience that completely changed my life. And immediately, I didn't have to sit there and consider what had just happened. I immediately accepted it for the truth that it was. And I told him, I said, okay, I may not understand what you're doing in this world, but I promise you this, to my last breath, you have my loyalty and connection, and you will never have to doubt that I will ever turn away from you. And it was at that time I asked him one question. I said, do I have to wait till I pass over to know what you guys what, what, what's happening in this creation? What are you doing in this world? What is your purpose and plan? And how does it work beyond my finite comprehension? And that was the only question I asked him. There was nothing else I asked of him. It was interesting. That was Thanksgiving. And on April 5th, at the age of 21, my mother in California, who was following Swami uh, Muktananda, said somebody gave her a big blue book. And I go, hmm, okay, how long is it? That's about 2,100 pages. And then I said, who wrote it? And she said, celestial beings. And I'm thinking California, the stuff in 1974 that was coming out of California was like, you know, I was a little reluctant because my background is as a scientist and I have 14 U.S. patents as a, 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 an industrial chemist for various corporations. So I have a sense of analytical structure on the way I look at things. And I said, Mom, here's what I will do. 2,100 pages. I will read the first 100 pages. And I will read it objectively. I will not put any effort to judge it just to read it objectively. And what do I read? The five father papers. And it was so true that I didn't stop it. I read the cover to cover in four months. I went back to reread the whole Bible because I had been a bibliophile throughout my, uh, throughout my teens. And then went back and did another cover to cover reading of the Arantia book. It has inspired me from the age of 21 to today, where every time I wake up in the morning with new consciousness, I thank the Father for the grace that he brought into my life. It changed the way I raised my children. It changed my values. It changed my whole experience. And none of this would have happened 
without his light and love. So that's my background on how I got the book. Uh, I would say today, let's talk about Makaventa. Makaventa, in all of the Urantia book, there are heroes. Now, obviously, the fourth ethical revelation and the coming of Michael in his seventh bestowal on our world is Jesus, was the greatest of all cosmic celestial figures that ever touched upon our planet. But there have been other heroes. We all know the story of Van and Amadon from the Caligastia Rebellion and how many hundreds of thousands of years that they stuck around trying to hold things together. And Amadon of human beginnings did not fail in his loyalty to either Van or to God. They certainly are heroes. But the biggest hero and the biggest contributor to bringing our world back on track is Makaventa, Melchizedek. Consider this. He, he took this world in all of the avails of Adam and Eve and so on. And, and 4,000 years ago, he asked for permission of the 12 receiving Melchizedek sons to our planet. And he said, we need to bring light into this world, a new epical revelation. And he got permission. Not only did he get permission from the Most Highs, and especially the representative Most High on our planet, but he was encouraged to do so. And look what he accomplished. And today, I, what I want to do is just do a summary not on what he accomplished, the Salem teachings. That's going to happen tomorrow during my workshop. Today, I want to bring the coming of Makaventa, how he got involved, and what he did on that first day in the tent and said, I am Melchizedek, and I am of the Most High. And then what happened there? So I'm going to leave it at that so you guys can then do your explorations over this weekend. All right, thank you for listening to me on that. Let me go down here and... All right, these are the Dalamatia teachings. I'm not going to read the paragraph. Uh, I want you to see the beautiful art. Dalamatia, Caligastia, the coming of the primary uh, midwares. Very, very interesting stuff. Let me go, though, to what I am going to go over. All right. These are the highlights of the first epical revelation, just summarizing it. One, half a million years ago, origin of the 50,000 primary midwares, 50,000, and brought about by a combination of physical and spiritual uh, intimacy between individuals of the uh, planetary staff, uh, who would then all of a sudden create these invisible beings. I have no idea how that all works. I don't think they say very much about it to us in the Arantia book. This also, he, his, what he did, uh, or the, at least what Caligashu tried to do, was to promote the true concept of the first source and center. To say that we are not in chaos, that there is a beginning, there is an unmoved mover of all reality. Promulgated on your ranch by 100 corporeal members of Prince Caligastia's staff, they all came from Jerusalem and volunteered. It lasted 300,000 years of service until Caligastia cast his lot with the Satan and Lucifer rebellion. So don't look at the fact that he did put an effort for that amount of time to do the right thing. But then he made a major mistake, obviously. And except for the work of Van and Amadon, the influence of the Dalamatian revelation was practically lost to the whole world. Even the Nodites had forgotten this truth by the time of Adam's arrival, 35 thereabouts years ago, many, many years after the arrival of Caligastia the planetary prince. 
Oops, let me go back up. So the second revelation, of course, were the Edenic teachings. Adam and Eve came here as a planetary uh, uh, material son and daughter. And it was their job to create a high degree of genetic upgrade that when it reached a, a, a maximum density of 1 million plus would then be spread throughout the world to all of the different tribal people and, and the different races. And obviously, Adam got frustrated, was not getting any help at all from uh, Caligastia. And uh, Eve, seeing that he was getting frustrated and it was depressing him, tried to come up with her plan, which was pretty much fed to her, like in the Bible story of the apple and the snake, of doing something that would quicken the upgrade of humanity, but short circuiting the way it was supposed to occur. So let me go into the summary. 37,000 years ago, this is now the origin of the secondary midwares. The Adam and Eve reintroduced the concept of the father uh, uh, to the evolutionary people. So it's no longer first source and center, but now of loving father, personality beyond his deity presence and power. Adam and Eve's early default aborted these teachings as well. This happened on our world and we all suffer. You know, we talk about the original sin of Adam that we all suffer from. Now, obviously the Old Testament has it wrong on explaining that, but when you consider the fact that we have to live because we were short-circuited with the plan of Adam and Eve and one million of their progeny being spread into our lives and in all of the service that they could have done. In many ways, we as humanity suffered the sin of the one man of Adam and Eve. So uh, their early default aborted these teachings, but some of them were carried on by the Sethite priests to the Levantine. The first garden family produced 1,647 pure line descendants. Now, that's not a million, but it had a power. It had a presence that we still feel today because it is the nature of that genetic upgrade, the infusion of it, that makes it very interesting and, and, and potential of what we could have achieved. And it lasted 117 years, ending finally in the default. So here we have two epical revelations that had so much promise and did not succeed. The third one, Melchizedek of Salem. And let's do a quick review. 1980 BC, and he spent 94 years in the flesh. 1973 years before the birth of Jesus, prepared the way for the bestowal of Michael. Now consider what he did. He spent that amount of time laying the groundwork that when Michael, uh, when Michael was born as the babe uh, of, of Jesus of Nazareth, that the people of the, the Hebrews had a single solidified religion of one God. And that they certainly do. You can read the Old Testament, the idea of their one God, but he lacked many of the qualities. He was started off as a tribal God because all the tribes of, of that area had their own gods. And when they went to battle with each other, it was considered that the winner had the stronger presence of God. But then it changed. And you get to Second Isaiah, well, all of a sudden, God is not speaking from Mount Sinai with explosions and, and, and fire and all these things. He speaks with a still, small voice. So when you look at the Old Testament, don't look at it as anything but a history of mankind's changing relationship to the Heavenly Father. He has never changed. But our understanding of him over the thousands of years has certainly gone through transitions. 
And by the time you come and ready with the minor prophets, the coming of Jesus was prepared. And we know what he did in the world 2,000 years ago. Uh, Machiavelli's teachings commingled with the various evolutionary religions, which evolved into the matured theologic systems present at the time of Jesus. So what did he do? Now, I'm going to get into it later. He did a lot of things in between those years, and we're going to discuss those. This is from Genesis. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, that's quite a title, uh, brought out bread and wine. And consider the idea of bread and wine being offered is the idea of holiness. Certainly Jesus did it at the Last Supper. Uh, and he blessed Abram. He was not called Abraham yet. His real name was Abram. But when Machaventa promised him, because of his faithfulness, to make him as multiplied as the stars in heaven, they changed his name from Abram to Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high. Now, look at that term, most high. That is the Verondedek son and the most high observer on Urantia at that time, so that when he materialized into the flesh, he was under sort of the supervision of the most high. And it's interesting how the Old Testament gets it right. He is the, he is the son and he's serving the purpose. And remember, they say the most highs serve by working within the history of mankind, our, 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 our activities, and they work very socially within our structure with an overall purpose, a scope. Can't read these, they're way too small, even in the book. Um, here, now let's go into this. This is one of the most important graphics I think I've ever put together. It starts off with the relationship of the universal father, paradise father, the universal, now get this, mother, son. You know, people say, you, you, you know, you attribute to the father male nature. Mm -mm. It's putting the cart before the horse. God is not of a gender. He has relationships of a triune trinity nature. And those get derived on the level of the local universes of duality, which then Michael and Mother Spirit create and generate human gender as we know it. So that is the universal father. They still use the language and the mother spirit. But then they also have the paradise mother uh, spirit, the infinite spirit. Now, when the father and the mother son get together and create a new from paradise eternity, a new concept of, of divine connection and relationship, thereby occurs a new creator son. And you can see under that, that's part of the paradise sons of God, the Michael sons. And here we now enter, we leave paradise an existential triunity, and we enter into the local universe creations, and we create duality. Duality is not perfection. It leaves an energy in it that requires uniting it. And that's what the Supreme Being is doing, is taking this incompletion of paradise perfection and triunity and trying to take the dualities, which are very plain in our reality, and bring them together. And then from there, they together, Michael on his own prerogative, without the mother's uh, uh, assistance, brings out the material sons and daughters, the Adams and Eves. And this he creates on his solo own. But when you get, look at what the mother and Michael do together on the level of experiential duality, first, they bring out the very high beings, the bright and morning stars. And then under that, the brilliant evening uh, stars, the archangels, uh, finally, Father Melchizedek. Now, this gets strange. 
they do he did not or they do not together create all the melchizedek sons they create the high son called the father melchizedek and then he conjoins with the father or, or with michael and and with the mother spirit and that's where all the other uh uh, Melchizedek's sons then originate. So they're secondary to the father Melchizedek. Don't ask me how to explain it. Uh, I mean, it's just too too difficult to completely comprehend, but that's what they reveal to us. So we have father Melchizedek's, we have the Verondedek sons, the most ties, not of a system like Satania, but of the higher constellation. And there are three of them always in a uh, ruling and watching over the going-ons of a whole constellation. And then, of course, we get the, you know, the constellation fathers, they call them. Then we get into the Lenonidic sons, of which there are two categories. Primary, Lucifer was a primary Lenonidic son. Uh, Satan and Caligastria were secondary Lenonidic sons. And there is a difference in terms of their high thinking and their ability to rule on the level of the systems. Uh, then you get into uh, the Cestacea and Univitatia. We're not going to talk about that, but they do come from the joint creation. And then finally, the mother on her own create the seraphim, cherubim, and sanabim, the granddaughters of the infinite spirit and her direct daughters of service and ministry. So that explains this divine family of God. And anytime you want to get a feel for its diversity and relationship, this helps me understand it. All right, Melchizedek's sons, they say, a special form of creative union between our creator's son and the creative mother spirit generated the original Melchizedek, the father Melchizedek. The father Melchizedek subsequently collaborated with the creator son and the creative spirit to bring into existence the entire group of the name Melchizedek sons. These sons who number more than 10 million in our local universe of Nevedon are self-governing and are primarily devoted to education and experiential training. Now, here I compare the most highs, the Verondidex sons, with the primary and secondary uh, uh, Lenonidex sons. And the quote from paper 20, section 1, paragraph 10. Melchizedeks are the joint offspring of a local universe creator son, creative spirit, and father Melchizedek. Both Verondidex and Lenonidex are brought into being by a creator son and his creative spirit associate. Verondidex are best known as the most highs, the constellation fathers. Lenonidex as system sovereigns and planetary princes, Lucifer, uh, Satan, and Caligastia. So that's just a quick summary of their relationship to one another. They say at least three Verondidics are assigned to the rulership of each one, each of the 100 constellations of a local universe. These sons are selected by the creator's son and are commissioned by Gabriel as the most highs of the constellations for service during one deca millennium. 10,000 standard years, about 50,000 years of Urantia time. Here's what they say about most ties. The hundred systems, about 100,000 inhabitable planets, make up a local universe constellation, and each constellation is presided over by three Herondidex suns. These three are known as the most ties since they embody the highest administrative wisdom coupled with the most far-seeing and intelligent loyalty. Every quarantined or isolated world, and certainly your rancha applies to that. Uh, let me get here. 
every quarantined or isolated world has a Verondedic sun acting as an observer. And we have our most high observer on our planet. It is this most high observer who, quotes, rules in the kingdoms of men. And they do when they have to. Uh, the Verondedek observer has been stationed on the planet ever since the Caligastia betrayal. And when Machavent of Melchizedek ministered on Urantia, he paid respectful homage to the most high observer then on duty, as he was truly the priest of the most high. There is now resident on Urantia a Verondedek son, an observer for the Most Highs of Edentia, and in the absence of direct action by Michael, trustee of planetary sovereignty. Machaventa, a Melchizedek son, has become forever a minister of the Most Highs, eternally assuming the assignment of service as a mortal ascender now. He has earned mortal ascender status. Having sojourned on your rancha in the likeness of mortal flesh at Salem in the days of Abraham. Now, the core of 12, he comes from the 12 core of, uh, of uh, Melchizedek's sons that are on our planet. And he was the one who volunteered to come and materialize in form to give his uh, ministry for the third ethical revelation. After the Caligastia succession in alignment with the Lucifer Rebellion, a Melchizedek core of 12 became receivers for our world until the time of Adam and Eve. They returned in authority after the time of Adam and Eve's default on down to the day when Jesus of Nazareth, as the Son of Man, became the sovereign planetary prince of Urantia. And that is the coming of Machavento. It's a lot, and I apologize if I'm hitting you over the head with it, but I want you to know why we're here this weekend. This is a huge scope. And uh, to learn about Machavento, who I say next to Jesus, is the second most important celestial being ever to serve our planet. And he has done it very well. Tomorrow morning, I have a workshop and I'm going to be talking about exactly what he did in those intervening years between his coming and the birth of Jesus. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stuart. As Stuart mentioned, uh, he's one of the uh, people giving a workshop in the first session tomorrow, and he's going to continue his uh, uh, some of the work he's done. And then we have, as you can see in the program, a fabulous lineup of additional plenary speakers who are going to move us forward from that moment when Melchizedek entered the tent of Abram all the way up until today by Sunday, we hope. Um, and uh, before we break and have a well-anticipated, I'm sure, uh, social gathering, and if you don't know where that is, it's up the stairs and uh, to the left. We have a room with, uh, that the social committee has, has prepared for us. Uh, but before we do that, we want to take um, a, some time and um, do something quite special as both um, uh, Matab via <laughs> Jackie and Jackie mentioned David Kulicki was obviously a, um, a, a instrumental not only in their personal spiritual journey, but all their work for the fellowship and the education committee. I only had the privilege of knowing David a very short time compared to most of you, um, but it's the quality, not the quantity, and I, I treasure it greatly. And uh, this was his brainchild. And if any of you, which most of you have been to any fellowship, education, uh, any any summer study session, and a lot of other things as well. You know David, and you've experienced his uh, his wisdom and his and his and his work and his love. 
And you also know if you've done any of those things that David was not alone. David was never alone. And uh, it, although not always, the, usually actually equally visible, but even the times when not visible, he was joined by his partner and wife of Marilyn. And um, I just wanna remind everybody that what, what we've read, men and women need each other in their moral and spiritual, as well as in their mortal careers. The differences in viewpoint between male and female persist even beyond the first life and throughout the local and super universe's ascension, as ascensions. And even in Havona, the pilgrims who were once men and women will still be aiding each other in the paradise ascent. Never, even in the core of the finality, will the creature metamorphosize, metamorphosize so far as to obliterate the personality traits that humans call male and female. Always will these two basic variations of humankind continue to intrigue, stimulate, encourage, and assist each other. Always will they be mutually dependent on cooperation in the solution of perplexing universe problems and in overcoming then the overcoming of manifold cosmic difficulties. Well, if any of you spent any time with David and Marilyn together, they constantly intrigued, stimulated, encouraged, and assisted each other, and constantly overcame many, many manifold <laughs> difficulties, cosmic and otherwise. So I want to uh, 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 ask Marilyn to come up and say a few words, and then we've got a, a presentation that she's going to graciously share with us as we remember David. I will get started because I know we're awaiting the social events. So <laughs> don't want to go too long. Um, I want to thank you so much, uh, Jackie and Matab. David had such high hopes for you both and he'd be so proud. Or more likely, he would say, I told you so. I knew all along you would become leaders because it was always about David. <laughs> um, you know, I might be called David's ex-wife, or sometimes I've been called a widow, actually, when I applied for a mortgage, they called me a widow, and I was kind of shocked at that. But I, I would consider myself David's eternal partner. And after the life we spent together, that to me represents our relationship. Not a widow, not an ex-wife, but a partner. I can't begin to thank so many of you for your cards, prayers, calls. I, um, it was astounding. There was a never a moment I felt without support. It was so engulfing one thinks um, that grief might overtake you, but not me. And I believe all of you were my supports. Thank you. David loved Gerantia Brotherhood. His family had been involved in it since just really forever. His grandfather was part of the, for the original forum. Then his, uh, four brothers and sisters became, uh, readers, uh, his, uh, dad was a president of your ancient brotherhood, and he had a um, another one of his brothers, Warren, Lynn and uh, Mark's father, who was also a president as well. So this organization meant everything to him from probably when he was in the womb. He knew <laughs> that he would be devoted to this organization. From 1973, he joined First Society. He served in most every position, president, I can't say how many times, maybe not miscellaneous committee because I was dubbed the chair of miscellany, which of course was the snacks and food, which I did valiantly over the years. <laughs> he also served on numerous brotherhood committees. He was on publications for six years, domestic extension for 11 years, and finally the committee he loved the most, the education committee. 
And he loved it because he was a teacher. And I think most people who had an opportunity to participate with him as a teacher learned a great deal, as I did over my almost 50 years. We would have been married 50 years <laughs> in another few years. But pretty much, he introduced me to the book. He argued with me over whether or not the book was correct or not. And it didn't only took me three years before he won. <laughs> So I'd like to share with you a, a really brief video that I created um, with my niece, Mary, uh, for his celebration of life. And it kind of takes you through his life and the life that we live together and our family. David accomplished more in his 71 years than most people accomplish in a lifetime. He was described as a superb teacher, a mentor and friend, a person full of passion for life and knowledge, a leader, and most often described as funny and witty. One of his nephews described him as eccentric, which isn't too surprising as he often spoke about a Shakespeare play or some other book he had just finished during our family gatherings. But maybe one of David's most important qualities was the way he touched people's lives. So many of you have beautifully expressed how David influenced your life. His family, friends, students, parents, and colleagues all told similar stories. In a way, his eccentricities made David stand out from others. David was one of the over 70 million baby boomers born after World War II. His family was a typical family of the times. He joined his father, Alvin, mother, Lucille, and sister, Adrian. He began his life in a small house in suburban Prospect Heights, Illinois. His father taught science in a nearby high school, and his mother cared for the family. Davis' life was not always the easiest during his early years. He became ill with the croup when he was two years old. He spent two weeks in the hospital, separated from his mother and father. It always amazed me how he remembered this event with such clarity. He considered it to be pivotal in his life, making separation sometimes difficult for him. After recovering, he returned to being an active child. He gained a new playmate when his younger brother Tom was born. He was the last child of the Kulicki family. David's high school years were filled with music. He played clarinet in Wheeling High School's marching band. He worked his way up to second chair in the highest symphonic band alongside his clarinet partner, Avi. David often spoke of his experiences in the Wheeling band. Mr. Depoy, his band director, was a mentor to him. He learned to strive for excellence, not for perfection, to persist even when things were hard, and gained a sense of self-confidence that changed his life. Of course, David was distracted by the usual things that distract a teenager, among them girls, cars, sports, and friends. But that would change as he met his lifetime partner, Marilyn. The first time David and I met was in a study hall at Wheeling High School. He was a senior and I was a freshman. I don't think I ever spoke to him, but he must have remembered me because the second time we met was during a band practice at the University of Illinois. David tells the story of how he asked to change the seating arrangement so that the first chair clarinet, him, sat next to the first chair oboe, me. So we began dating. I was totally awed by him. He introduced me to a new world of books, music, sports, and travel. I couldn't see a life without David, so we became engaged. And finally, in 1974, we were married. I can barely describe what it was like to be married to David. Along with the ups and downs of most marriages, he was committed to our family. David was always proud to announce that on August 24th, 2024, we would have been married 50 years, quite the lifetime achievement. 
family was always important to David. With the arrival of his children, his life changed dramatically. He was now a devoted father who juggled family responsibilities while earning a master's degree at Northwestern University. And, oh yes, we can't forget his beloved dogs, who were also his pride and joy. Lauren was our firstborn. David described the day she was born as one of the happiest days of his life. Being a bit of a colicky baby, he could be seen lugging around diaper bags, bottles, and our miracle baby swing, which always seemed to settle her down. David loves sports, any kind of sports. He taught Lauren how to play basketball and baseball. They watched Sunday football games together, even though one or the other of them could be seen snoozing on the couch. Lauren shared her father's appreciation of music, plays, and history. He loved to watch movies, especially sci-fi and fantasy. The whole family eagerly awaited the new Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, and the Harry Potter movies. David's love of dogs was passed on to Lauren. She was almost nine years old when her father let her pick out her first dog. It was really the family dog, but nonetheless, Lauren chose a beautiful golden retriever that she named Brooke. Golden retrievers soon became David's favorite breed of dog. Being the firstborn, their relationship was quite special. Lauren attributes her ability to argue a point, sometimes into the ground, that resulted from her dad's tutelage. Although David had never been her teacher, he was an ardent supporter of everything she did. Plays, recitals, birthdays, or even sport events. Lauren was always bringing new friends to the house to be entertained by her father's humor. That was David. Anything to make an audience laugh. Ryan was born next. He was the middle child and David's only son. Like Lauren, David connected with Brian over their mutual love for science fiction and fantasy movies and shows. They could be spotted many weekday evenings parked on the couch, making their way through the Star Trek Next Generation series. Perhaps what united them most was their ability to think beyond this world and to use their intellect to imagine the world as it could be. Brian was the first to make David a grandfather as Ariella joined the family. David doted on his granddaughter and developed a special bond with her, of course, more often over their mutual love of dogs. Liam and Aiden joined the family next and in true form, David imparted little bits of wisdom when the boys could sit still long enough to listen. Brian and his sons are the last of David's line to be able to pass along the Kulicki name. Through them, the legacy of Mr. Kulicki lives on. Ellen was the last to join our family. As she would say, we were saving the best for last or at least the closest for last, after she bought the house next door to us. David and Ellen had much in common. They both loved dogs and even surprised me, really surprised me, when they brought home brother and sister golden retriever puppies with lovely red bows on them. I guess they thought they were giving me a present. David was so proud that Ellen followed in his footsteps. She played the clarinet, and became an English teacher herself. They enjoyed many discussions together about countless topics, among them the environment, books they'd read, or even the politics of the day. Ellen married Dan Macias, and they have two children, Oliver, five, and Gabe, two. They were lucky to have their papa right next door. David would come over often so that his dog, Bernie, could romp around in the yard and enjoy the outdoors with his grandsons. The whole Macias crew will miss the fixture that David was in their lives. I couldn't forget the final members of our family, dogs. Just like our family was never without books, our family was never without a dog. David's dogs seemed to have this mysterious effect on him. 
They comforted him and maybe gave him a sense of security. Over the years, we had 10 different dogs, the most notorious being Bruce. He was responsible for dropping our Thanksgiving turkey on the floor. And later he decided to jump into my car to sniff and then smush my graduation cake. I was frantic, but David treated him like always with his unconditional love. David enjoyed spending time with his extended family. His vacations, as well as holidays and gatherings, were made more special by being surrounded by those he loved. He was always the first to offer to mentor his nieces and nephews, ever the ultimate teacher. A book, too, can be a star, a living fire to lighten the darkness, leading out into the expanding universe, by Madeline Dangle. David's love of reading began when he was a child. He would read Jack London's books about dogs, Kerwood's book about Kazan the wolf dog, and Tertoon's book about Buff the collie. One wonders if his fascination with dogs began as a young boy. His first dog, a collie, arrived when he was eight. She was shipped to his childhood home in a crate after being ordered from the Sears catalog. The more you read, the more you will know. The more you will learn, the more places you'll go, Dr. Seuss. Dave's love of books continued throughout his life. His curiosity for what he might find in a book gave him great pleasure. He delighted in finding books, holding them, reading the words and ideas, and finally thinking about what he had read. David was quite a collector of books. His book collection started on one bookshelf and eventually grew to 17 full length wall bookshelves located in almost every room of our house. He truly believed Marcus Cicero who wrote, a home without books is a body without a soul. Wherever he traveled, there was always room in his luggage for new books to be added to his collection. In England, we visited the Folger Shakespeare Library where he added to his Shakespeare collection. In Italy, after visiting the Vatican Library, he added several new books on religion and philosophy. In Japan, we visited a mega bookstore where he found a book on haiku poetry. David was never far from a book. That may have been his eccentricity or maybe the source of his extensive knowledge. Besides his love of books, David was known for his sense of humor. He had this uncanny ability to tell a pun or a joke or a funny story in virtually any situation. When you laugh, you change, and when you change, the world changes, Madame Kataria. One form of humor that David mastered over his years of teaching was telling puns, but he didn't just tell a pun. He would stop and look around the room to make sure that everyone realized he had just told one. Are you listening? Then maybe laughter or smiles, but oftentimes groans. By now, everybody was listening, and that was exactly what he wanted to happen. Now he had our attention. His jokes had a similarly provocative effect. One of his favorites a rabbi, priest, and a minister cross the road. What? So where did they go? Maybe across the road? By now, everybody is thinking about where they went, and that is exactly what he wanted to happen. With minds engaged, he could now return to a lesson. David loved to tell stories. After reading and studying literature his entire life, he very well knew how to tell a story. He would weave together history, philosophy, and values related to the topic at hand, but no story was complete without an unexpected twist along the way. David's appreciation of music began early in his life. He told stories of how his father would play classical music as he worked late into the night. On Sunday mornings, David would listen to records and then later CDs of composers such as Anton Bruckner and Gustav Mahler, who were among his favorites. David never missed an opportunity to attend a live musical event. In Chicago, he enjoyed the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Musicals were among his favorites. 
in New York. We saw My Fair Lady. In Germany, we attended the longest opera in history, Wagner's Ring Cycle. Actually, we didn't sit through all 15 hours of it. In Japan, we enjoyed the puppet theater, Bunraku. Beautiful music always spoke to David's heart and mind. David was not only a lover of music, but a player of music as well. He began playing the clarinet in middle school. This started his lifelong passion to improve and gave him opportunities to teach clarinet as well. He was so proud of his clarinet students who made high marks in competitions, many of whom received music scholarships, which afforded them the opportunity to attend the college and universities of their choice. For more than 50 years, David played his clarinet in bands and orchestras, but maybe his favorite was our woodwind quintets. David's joy of music never ended, nor do I think it will. If they have harps up there, why not clarinets? In his later years, Bull's fever overtook David. Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and the Dream Team became the center of David's sports world. When in Malaga, Spain on vacation, Dave remained awake until three o'clock in the morning to see the championship Bulls game. Not surprisingly, the commentators only spoke Spanish, so he barely understood a word, but he did know that they won. A moment of pure joy for David. Michael Jordan expresses his philosophy on success. He says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Although David and I never really talked about what he would have liked me to say after he passed, I do know that there were some things that were very important to him. I believe that he left each of us with a gift, a different gift perhaps, but a gift that could be opened and shared in as many ways as our own talents and opportunities afford us. However, David was never passive. He always looked for opportunities and teaching became his. One of his favorite quotes was from Daniel Burnham, the architect of Chicago's 1893 World's Fair. Burnham said, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized. I think just as Burnham envisioned a transformed city, David envisioned a transformed world. I know that David firmly believed in an afterlife and was not a bit bothered that human death was the end, but rather the beginning of a progressive journey with God. A final thought from Shakespeare, who in many ways was one of David's mentors. He wrote, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. And I believe that David's passion was in helping those he taught to explore what they might become. In closing, whatever gift David gave to you, please return it to others. Catherine Hyde writes, if you can't pay it back, pay it forward. If that could be done, it would be the greatest honor that you could pay to David. Thank you for celebrating with us. And thank you very much for all that you've done for David. It will always be remembered.